Um, we've got a timer up here so you can all cheer along to make sure that you can actually get this done under the, uh, under the timer. If he goes over 20 minutes, uh, then he's got to drink a lot of vodka. So, surprise! Um, what could go wrong? Um, you almost ready? All right, you tell me when you're ready. I'll start the timer and uh, we're gonna do this. Makes sense. So, so this is really fun. This is uh, Matt. How many have I given? It's like my how many nerd night? Like my fifteen? Yeah, no. Nine. 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 My ninth nerd night presentation. <laughs> it's like, like nine. you lose track after all. First one I've ever done that's made Matt drink. drink beer though. Uh, this is gonna be really exciting. This is gonna be really high tense. So once we get go, I'm gonna need lots of noise, yeah. lots of cheering. Lots of doing shots along with Matt, because otherwise he's going to feel like a loner. You guys don't want that. So Matt, on a three, we're going to do this. All right. All right. One, two. Let's do it. All right. So everybody knows Harry Houdini, the greatest magician who ever lived, the greatest escape artist who ever lived. But what a lot of people don't know about him is that perhaps his greatest passion in life was something very different. It was busting up psychics and mediums. And what he would do is he would travel through towns and on tour, he'd have an act, part one would be magic, part two would be escape, and part three would be calling out by name the local medium and then telling everybody in whatever town they were in what they were doing and how they did it. And the way he would do this is earlier in the day, he would show up at whatever seance was going up in town in the skies. Uh, he would show up like this, as an old man. Because Harry Houdini was a movie star. He was one of the most famous Americans alive at the time, so he had to go undercover. My favorite thing is the pseudonym he used was F. Rod. <laughs> and his assistant got in on the act too, and she had a whole bunch of disguises. A woman seeking lost relatives, a fan from the country, my favorite, a tipsy consultant. That is his size. All right, hey, Gab Sandalgio. Anybody know who this guy is? No, okay. He was uh, born in Egypt. He was a violin player who discovered later in life an affinity for a very obscure art form called micro-miniature art. That is, sculptures and pieces of art so small that you literally need a microscope to see them. That is the end of a needle, and that is Snow White and the Seven Doors. This art was so perilous that he had to time his brushstroke movements between breaths, like a sniper, sort of, because those micro movements would ruin everything. If he coughed at the wrong point, months of work went away. And then, like anybody else who did this art form, he painted them. Now, think about that for a minute. He painted that Pope, he painted that Goofy, he would shave pieces of hair and use diamond dust and all these things, it is bonkers. You can see it in LA, the Museum of Jurassic Technology. Number three, Lonnie Johnson. Lonnie Johnson was a NASA engineer, a nuclear engineer, created this world-changing water filtration system that could bring clean water to millions of people, but of course we know him best for something else entirely, and that is he invented the super soaker. <laughs> The way he told me, I spoke to him about this a while back, the way he described it was, I was working on a heat pump that used water as working fluid, and I made some jet pumps for it, and accidentally shot a stream of water across the bathroom where I was doing the experiment, and thought to myself, this would make a great gun. A couple years later, everybody's got super servers. That was an original prototype and a PVC pipe. Kind of cool. All right, up next, Josephine Cochran. Josephine Cochran was a socialite. Josephine Cochran had dinner parties. Josephine Cochran was so upset that the help were breaking and chipping her, her valuable china uh, while cleaning the dishes that she thought there has to be a better way and so was invented the automatic dishwasher. Uh, because a socialite did not want people to chip her dishes. And unlike virtually every other woman you will see here tonight, she actually got credit and fame and fortune for her work. So good for Josephine. Uh, the uh, company she founded is now part of Whirlpool. So there you go. Uh -huh. Sylvan Goodman. Sylvan Goodman, of course, invented the shopping cart. He was an Oklahoma City uh, supermarket. Thank you, Shushers. Uh, an Oklahoma City supermarket owner who really was trying to find a way to get people to buy more stuff. So he said maybe if they had a cart, they could carry more than they could just carry out of here. Well, men were like, that's a feminine, I'm not doing that. And women were like, that looks like a baby carriage, I'm not doing that. And so nobody wanted to use his shopping cart. So he had an idea. He thought, maybe if I get all the hottest people in town to be seen using my shopping cart, everybody will want to use the shopping cart. 
And so he did what many companies now do today when they pay hot people to use their products. He paid hot people to use their products, and so everybody wanted to use a shopping cart because the hottest people in Oklahoma City were using shopping carts, and it became a cultural phenomenon in many ways defining the post-war prosperity boom of America. The fact that you could buy so much food, it would fill a cart. What a novel concept. That must have been. And Chua Boyari, you guys know him better, of course, as Chef Boyardee. Uh, Chef Boyardee was a truly interesting individual. He was, of course, from Italy. He became the head chef at the Plaza Hotel, then moved to Cleveland, Ohio. Yeah. Opened a restaurant in Cleveland when it, and became famous for the deliciousness of his sauce. And people said, I want that sauce. Why can't I have that sauce? So he thought, maybe I'll can that sauce. People waited in line for hours to buy that sauce. Well, the war starts to happen, World War II that is, and suddenly this guy has this canned food operation, well that makes a lot of good sense for, for war rations, doesn't it? So he was literally growing tomatoes in Pennsylvania to create Italian food, perhaps the first Italian food many Americans had ever tasted, to be shipped to American troops in Italy, which is this great <laughs> circular nature here, um, won all sorts of medals and awards for rationing and, and feeding the troops, in many ways a war hero on the home front, won you know, presidential accolades, all these medals. After the war, he was faced with this issue, which is, well suddenly, they don't need me as much, I have to lay off so many people. And he said, there's no way I'm doing that, so he made a decision. He said, I'm gonna sell to a big company so I don't have to lay off all these people, which is where Chef where he is today, because when you look at that can, don't think corporate greed, think, that can is on that shelf because this man wanted to save people in Pennsylvania's jobs. Kind of a cool dude. How pretty like each. He invented the New York subway, if that makes any sense. Well, before the subways we know it, he created a one-stop mnemonic subway line underneath downtown New York. And the way he got away with this is what is so cool, because it's the late 1800s, everything had to go through the Tammany Hall political machine. They're not gonna just say, go ahead and build a subway. They want their piece, they want their taste, they want their cut. And so what he says is he lies. He says, we're gonna use this for shipping mail and nothing else. Well, of course, you know, mail could mean big people, I guess. Um, so it never really made it to mass production, kind of laid the ground. It was in this mnemonic tube system that would actually, ironically, later be used for mail. Underneath Manhattan is a massive network of mnemonic tubes that were used until actually rather recently to ship mail all over the city. It's the same technology that is now used, cool picture, in the Hyperloop. But my favorite thing about this guy is nothing to do with this is that he has a patent on an invention, a game that I, I'm shocked never caught on, something called parlor bowling, centrifugal bowling. And the problem he was trying to solve was that bowling is fun, but you can't really do it in your living room, at least not in good company, unless you want to break all your china. You know, second time that's come up tonight. So he thought, maybe we'll do some loop-de-loops here. Patent to this, it was gonna be the next big thing in uh, in-home entertainment never really caught on. Speaking of insane loop-de-loops, we have our next guy, which is Eugene Mulvihill. Eugene Mulvihill here with one of the largest private wine collections in the world, but that's not what we're talking about tonight. What we're talking about tonight is his theme park creation, which of course is Action Park. Does anybody know what Action Park is? Good, you guys rock! Action Park was the world's only 100% participation theme park, which is another way of saying, uh, buyer beware, you might get hurt. Uh, as Wikipedia put it, the park's popularity went hand in hand with the reputation for poorly designed unsafe rides, underage, undertrained, often under influenced staff, intoxicated, unprepared visitors, and then consequently poor safety records. Or as I like to put it, everything you need to know about Action Park is that the photo I'm about to show you was a water slide that humans went down. <laughs> Action Park, Traction Park. That's all you need to know about Action Park. Anybody here ever go to Action Park by chance? There you go. You guys are cool. The place was awesome. But again, this guy, so, so until a couple years ago, it was kind of almost an urban myth, a legend, that people had actually gone down there. There was not much evidence of humans going down this water slide. Um, I did a documentary about Action Park, and one of the, um, the former director of operations reached out to me and told me he was digging through his garage and he found a VHS tape, and on his tape was the only known footage of humans going down this water slide, which I will share with you guys right now. Well, first of all, for scale, that's a guy. That's a person. This thing, and also, that's a rubber mat. That's not a pool. Uh, so, but here is footage of, here You know, so they spray people down with a hose because they found it made it more likely for them to show up on the other side. <laughs> And backwards, oh too. Yeah. I'd ride it. <laughs> so you're gonna see the hose. 
and backwards. <laughs> that, my friends, is Action Park. And there's nothing in the world like Action Park. Elizabeth McGee. Lizzie McGee uh, invented Monopoly. My good friend Mary Pollan, who I don't think is here tonight, wrote a book about this. The thing about Monopoly is that the origin story, the official story, is as created by a Charles, uh, I'm going to say Darwin, but it's not. My brain is farting right now. Uh, during the Great Depression, this true rag door just started. The truth is actually created by a woman, and the initial game was a actually a Quaker socialist folk game uh, designed to teach children about the evils of capitalism. I don't know how things get twisted. Um, just the original kind compared to the uh, patent for the game Monopoly. It's basically the same thing. But again, my favorite thing about her is not this. It's that she's kind of a rabble-rouser in her time. She did this weird stunt where she took out a newspaper ad offering to sell herself to as a slave to the highest bidder as a sort of commentary on women's role in society. She was really cool. That could be the subject of news stories. The goal of the stunt was to make a statement about the dismal position of women. We are not machines. Girls have minds, desires, hopes, and ambitions. Really cool. All right, up next, Timothy Dexter. Anybody know who this guy is? He's my favorite. Timothy Dexter was sort of, again, a New England socialite in the early 1800s who everybody hated. Everybody hated this guy. And, but inexplicably, in this Forrest Gump-like fashion, he just found success after success after success. After success. And then what happened repeatedly was people would give him intentionally bad business advice with the hopes that he would follow it and thus fail. But inexplicably, time and again, Due to chance and circumstance, he would end up succeeding behind anybody's wildest dreams. So somebody said, hey, Timothy, you should sell coal in Newcastle, the biggest coal-producing place in the world. So he does that, and he shows up on the exact day of a minor strike. Makes millions, makes tons. This guy, again and again, this sort of thing would happen. But my favorite thing about Timothy is two things. One is he had this big mansion in which he had statues dedicated to the great humans of Earth, Napoleon, uh, George Washington, and of course himself, uh, <laughs> si situated on a, on a pillar. And he put out this book, which inexplicably became a bestseller, despite the fact that it had nary a mark of punctuation in it. So in further subsequent printings, the publisher said, Timothy, please put punctuation in your book. And he said, mm, okay, but I'm going to do it my way. Which means a page in the back of the book with... Uh, <laughs> I put it up here, they may pepper and salt as they please. Also, this book was called A Pickle for the Knowing Ones or Plain Truth in a Homespun Dress. It mostly consists of him complaining about his wife. The dude was, was a piece of work. Look him up. After Action Park, second best page on Wikipedia. Um, Ruth Wakefield. She meant the Toll House cookies. <laughs> There's a lot of stories here. Um, there's two different uh, versions of events here, unclear which is which. One is certainly more dramatic than the other, so I'll give you both. You decide which one you want to believe. One is that she was just making chocolate cookies. Cookies had some Nestle semi-sweet chips, decided to put them in a little bit late into the process, thinking that chocolate would permeate the entire cookie and become a chocolate cookie, when in fact it became a chocolate chip cookie, the world's first chocolate chip cookie. Um, and then there's stories that say, no, she knew exactly what she's doing. Either way, we have her to thank for chocolate chip cookies, which is really cool. I'll say, Mary Anderson, she invented the windshield wiper. Story was, she didn't even have a driver's license. She had never driven a car in her life. But she was on a streetcar one day, and she saw the driver get out in the middle of a rainstorm and manually wipe off the windshield. And she thought there has to be a better way. Patented it, tried to sell it to all the big car companies, and one after another, they basically told her there is no commercial future for this product. <laughs> Nobody will ever want this product. Nobody will ever want this product. Now we all have this product, but long after the patent expired. So, sorry, Mary. Um, Lee Lance, I love I can find a photo of this guy, but Lee Lance took this fish. Genius businessman. He said, Patagonia toothfish. This is a delicious fish. Disgusting name. I'm not going to go to a restaurant order Patagonia toothfish, but what if we call it something different? Chilean sea bass. <laughs> so, now endangered because it's too popular. Um, Harry Mounts. Harry Mounts invented the pinball flipper. What a lot of people may not know is that pinball, of course, was illegal for many years in many cities throughout the country, including New York City, which had a pinball squad. The mayor, Mayor LaGuardia, orchestrated many raids. I have spoken about this at Nernet a couple times, so you guys might have seen this. Raids uh, across the city's dens, wiping out pinball machines, arresting their owners. This is Mayor LaGuardia pushing over a pinball machine after a raid. I love this photo because the pinball machine is taller than him. Um, <laughs> And this is the, uh, the, the police commissioner smashing a pinball machine. And I love this photo because that could be a scene from Boardwalk Empire or The Untouchables if you just subbed out a no barrel of whiskey. This is so cool, right, guys? And it's pinball. It's innocent. 
But, oh, here's some more raids, police seizures, pushed by police. But the thing about pinball is that the reason it was illegal was because it was considered to be a game of chance and not skill, and thus, according to logic of time, that meant it was, by definition, gambling. And so, in these early days, there were no flippers and machines. There was a lot of luck. You were nudging the machine, hoping it would do certain things, but at the end of the day, the, the ball was wild. So this guy said, maybe there's a way to give the player more control, more agency. And the flipper was invented. And now it is basically the defining feature of the pinball machine. The very first game to have a flipper was a game called Humpty Dumpty. And it didn't look like, you know, say you have two flippers in the middle. This was tiny flippers on the outside, kind of facing the wrong way. It took a little bit more, a few more steps in evolution to get where we are today. Cool story, though. All right, Edward Moybridge. Anybody know who this is? OK, Edward Moybridge was, uh, he was a mild-mannered bookseller who one day got into a stagecoach accident, hit his head, suffered severe brain trauma, recuperated with a doctor who many people think was Jack the Ripper, but that's another story. Um, when he woke up, his personality had changed completely. No longer was he a mild-mannered bookseller. He was a creative free spirit, an artist, and he took up a camera in the burgeoning days of this, of this, this art form we call photography. And he did bonkers things, these daredevil photos of Yosemite, which he literally hanging from cliff sides with these massive photo bricks, changed what people thought photography could do. In, the early, in these days, photos were basically, in the same way you might buy a Netflix subscription or a DVD or something, you would buy a photo and that would be your entertainment. His photos <laughs> sold like gangbusters, <laughs> serious. Um, he's best known perhaps for his motion studies he did on horses, which are very, very famous, kind of showing Basically, the, the, the story is that Leland Sanford, the former governor of California, or Robert Barron, uh, was a, patronage of Moorbridge, a patron of Moorbridge, and was engaged in a, a bet with another Robert Barron about whether a horse's feet all left the ground during a trot. Important questions of the day. Yeah. Nobody could prove it because photos just didn't show that. So, so Moorbridge was tasked with basically creating this new high-speed photography rig that would line a horse track in order to show in real time every little gallop and step of the horse to show that, yes, the horse's feet did lead during a trot. And what he eventually created all this was something called the Zoopraxiscope, which is widely regarded as the very first movie projector ever made before Edison. Totally different technology, sort of a technological dead end. It's a, you know, glass plates didn't really work that well. But he invented movies. And the other cool thing about him is that his personality changed so much after that accident that not only was he a creative free spirit, but he was also a cold-blooded murderer. And uh, ended up uh, going up to his wife's mister, I guess you call it, and just saying, I have a message for you, and shooting him in the head. He was acquitted. <laughs> Jason Badgett, speaking of sort of unexpected uh, savant genius out of nowhere, this, this guy was a, a bro, a jock, whatever, until he got beat up outside a karaoke bar, woke up as a mathematical genius, one of the very few people alive with... Oh, come on. Guys. Uh, very few people alive with the same we call uh, Sun Zabonson, I forgot the name, whatever. Um, also, perhaps the only known, known person who can hand draw fractals. He sells his art and it's this incredibly intricate things. He says he can sort of see the motions of time. It's very strange. Listen to him talk. Only after getting beat up at a karaoke bar did this occur, though. Irving Selikoff. Irving Selikoff did a lot of things. He discovered that asbestos is bad for you. Um, but that's not what we're talking about today. He, uh, so, so backstory after World War II, we had all the, the Nazis all these V2 rockets, and the fuel that was that was fueling these V2 rockets was basically hydrazine. And the Allies confiscated massive amounts of hydrazine. They go, what do we do with this hydrazine? So they said to all the pharmaceutical industry, the medical industry, here's a bunch of hydrazine. Do what you're going to do with it. So people started playing around with this hydrazine, and some really important TB drugs were, were derived from the hype from the V2 rocket fuel that Irving Selikov was involved with. This is really cool. So Irving Selikov was at, I think it was a TV board at Seaview Hospital in Staten Island, when he notices something very strange is happening. Now all the patients aren't just, you know, doing well with their TV, they're also dancing and happy and just, so this isn't what you think a hospital should look like. A, re a reporter was there and seeing all these patients dancing around, it turned out he had stumbled onto the first antidepressant drugs, which uh, came from Nazi rocket fuel, which is crazy. These, from, this is how um, MAOI inhibitors were invented. Everybody knows anything about this. And uh, we've got some depressed people here. We go. Um, and uh, this is, these are TV and presumably depressed people just dancing in hallways. Does not look like that, though. So cool. 
Okay, John Cade. Speaking of similar things here, John Cade discovered lithium. You don't invent lithium, you discover what lithium does. Lithium is an element, you don't invent lithium. But the story behind this is nuts. He was from Australia during World War II. He was a POW, I think, in Singapore when he noticed all of his fellow POWs were going a little wackadoo, a little crazy. He started theorizing all these ideas, and he thought, someone going like manic and then cycles up, and he thought every time they urinate, maybe they're peeing out toxins. So he became obsessed with the idea that pee had these toxins that caused all these manic issues. So after the war, he sets up a lab, and he basically starts injecting chemicals from urine into guinea pigs to see what will happen. The problem is some of these chemicals, things like uric acid, they don't really dissolve well in the water. So he says, maybe I'll put it in lithium, because lithium uh, will kind of, it's more water soluble, it's easier to, to mess with here. And then he notices something else. These guinea pigs, they're really chill, they're cool. So they're also just like, having a good time. And thus we discover that lithium is this incredible psychiatric drug. Really, really cool. Hans Berger invented the EEG. This story is crazy. Hans Berger uh, was in almost his accident, almost died at the exact same moment his sister claimed to have a psychic reading from him in which she knew he was in danger. Ever since then, he became obsessed with the idea of psychic waves and telepathy and looking for ways to measure it to become sort of an outcast in the fringes of medical community. I'm gonna finish this shit. Um, <laughs> Yeah, out, out, out passing the fringes of society. And, uh, and so we did see the EG as a way of measuring psychic energy. It did not measure psychic energy, but it did measure alpha waves, it turned out. And sometimes crazy people stumble into cool things. Kind of neat. Uh, Hanson Gregory, his mother Elizabeth, he didn't invent the donut, he invented the hole in the donut. And <laughs> uh, so he was a sea captain, and he was away with his people, and his mother made these delicious treats that she would give him. He was a young guy saying, share these with your sailor friends to make friends. And they were nuts in the middle of dough. Um, and she would deep fry them. But the center was raw, and people would eat them and get sick. And when you're in a ship and you're the guy making everybody sick, you are nobody's friend. It is not working. So eventually, he comes up with a solution. I'm just going to cut out that middle, because the outside's all fried, but the middle, it's raw. It's going to cut out. And throw it away. And thus was invented the donut hole, Hansi Gregory. And it's great. This is the birthplace of Captain Hansi Gregory for the donut hole. And I have one more bonus one here. I just saw this the other day on the internet, so I wanted to put this on here. Lenny Montana played Luca Brasi in The Godfather. I did not know this. Anybody know the story behind this dude? He was actually a mob enforcer for the Colombo crime family, sent to the set to monitor the film to make sure that they were presenting the mob in a proper fashion. <laughs> Francis Ford Coppola sees this guy and goes, you're my Luca Brasi, you're, you're the kids in the movie, uh, you're in. Um, it turns out though, he would then regale the cast and crew with his stories of a mob enforcer, in which he was a, I will say, a genius arsonist. Um, <laughs> He used to tell us all these things, like he was in, he tied tampons into a mouse, dip it in kerosene, light it, let the mouse run through a building, put a candle from a cuckoo clock, when the cuckoo would pop out, the candle would fall over and start a fire. So, watch that movie again. <laughs> and that is it, folks. Thank you so much. Go to nerdnight.com to find a Nerd Night event near you. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel for our latest presentation.